Today, we cover game one of the 2021 World Chess Championship. My name is Nathan. Welcome to MTX Chess. Hello, everyone. Welcome to MTX Chess. Today, we're reviewing the game between Ian Napomniachi and Magnus Carlsen uh, that happened today, the game one of the World Chess Championship. So without further ado, let's just jump in. Ian Napomniachi of Russia with the white pieces and Magnus Carlsen of Norway with the black pieces. Napomniachi starts us off with e4, e5, knight of three, knight c6, bishop b5. This is the Rui Lopez, um, and after a6, we have the Morphe defense. a4, knight f6, castle kingside, bishop e7 for, for Magnus, and rook e1. So far, all very standard moves that you'd expect to see in a Rui Lopez between two grandmasters. b5, bishop b3, black castles kingside. Here, Napomniachi elects to play h3, and this is the anti-martial uh, attack line, Rui Lopez line. For those of you who don't know what the martial attack is, the martial attack is a famous counterattack from black that happens in just about this position. If white were to play a move towards the center, like c3, black would play d5. After e takes d5, knight takes d5, knight takes e5, a couple exchanges here on e5, we get, a, get to this position, where black has great attacking chances after c6, with the eventual bishop d6, putting pressure here on h2, queen coming to h4. This is named after Grandmaster Frank Marshall, who first played this against Capablanca, who was a world ch world chess champion in the early 20th century. So Napomniachi wanting to avoid that, that whole line I just showed you, elected to play h3. After h3, Carlsen has knight a5. So this is the first really surprising move that we see from Carlsen. And I think this move is... Um, indicative of how the game has really changed in the modern era. Napomniachi's, uh, what, what's going on in this position right here is that Carlson is basically giving up this pawn to get the bishop pair. So Carlson's going to trade his knight for Napomniachi's bishop, and in exchange, Napomniachi will pick off the pawn. Normally, you'd think that Napomniachi would really consider this position for a long time, but it really didn't take him very long at all to just take the pawn here. And this, what does this tell us about modern chess? Really, these players are so well prepared for these games. They have had computer engines kind of giving them positions, and I'm sure that Napomniachi had this exact position over the board and knew that if Magnus were to go with a5, that knight takes e5, which just is a great move. It took him about two minutes to play this move. Magnus takes the bishop. Napomniachi responds, a takes b3. After bishop b7, d3 protecting this e4 pawn, black plays d5. We get exchanges on d5, and after uh, black's queen captures on d5, you can see black here is obviously threatening checkmate on g2. So white plays queen f3. And this is the key position of the game, really, and a bit of an, a bit of an impasse as well. There are a lot of different ways the game could proceed. So obviously black could exchange queens, just queen for queen straight up. But after, um, but if this were to occur, after the knight takes, black would have to spend a move defending this bishop from the rook, and that would give white time to develop. So that's one option for black, if we go here. Another option for black would be simply taking uh, the knight with the queen. But this loses uh, for uh, for really, uh, this loses a pawn. So let's, let's see what white would do in this position here. Here, white could not take the bishop, right? Because then black would take the rook with check. So that wouldn't work for white. So what white would have to do would be to capture the queen. And then after the bishop captures the queen, white would take this bishop. And black would have to move this this light square bishop to safety. And in, after they do that, they would lose the pawn. So here in this position, white is up two pawns. And that's not a position black wants to be in. Magnus and Napoleon actually see all of that. And Magnus's next move in this position is bishop d6. Now if queen takes knight, rook takes uh, queen, and black picks off the queen here, this rook is going to have to retreat. They're not going to have any squares to go to to pick the pawn off. Napomniachi plays king f1, and so now if black decides to take on e5, the white queen is able to take on, on b7 because this rook is now protected. Um, a very interesting line here. Instead of taking this rook, what Carlson could have played this line and then opted for queen h2, but after queen f3, queen h1 check, king e2, one of the rooks would probably come here to e8, 
this is a tough line to play for 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 black they've got to get their queen back into the action somehow and it's unclear uh really how black would recover from from kind of having such a poorly positioned queen so to avoid that scenario black plays magnus played rook b8 and so now you see after the queen takes the knight queen b7 is not an option because queen b7 they would just they would just lose the queen so a lot of moves here uh that seem a little bit random like bishop d6 like king f1 like rook b8 but they're all having to do with this uh, the possibility of exchanging queens here in the center uh Nepomne actually just decides to le relieve the tension with queen takes d5 and after knight takes d5 bishop d2 c5 Nepomne actually kind of went into a deep think here it took him about 20 minutes to find this move knight f3 so let's talk about this knight f3 move and, and why it took so long to find. So Nepomniachtchi really wants to develop this light, this this knight here on b1. Obviously the knight can't, uh, if the knight comes to a3, it's not a great square. Obviously the knight can't go to d2, so the logical move would be knight c3. But after something like knight c3, black has this really great square b4. And this puts pressure directly on the c2 pawn. How's white gonna defend this c2 pawn? Well, if white tries to defend with this, this rook right here, the knight on e5 falls. So that wouldn't work for white. So white would be forced to defend with this rook here on a1, and now black has all the power on the a-file. Re they really have no competition on the a-file after that. So Nepomniachtchi saw that, wanted to keep this a1 rook on the a-file, and so elected to play, um, instead of playing knight c3 right away, elected to play knight f3. Magnus centralizes is going to centralize his rooks to put pressure on these pawns, and now Nepomniachtchi can play that knight c3, that move that he's prepared. After knight b4, white white can now defend the c2 square with this rook, because remember, this rook's no longer defending the knight on e5, because that knight was moved. And now rook a c8, uh, further kind of adding pressure down on these, these central files for Magnus. After knight e2, what Nepomniachtchi is basically saying with this move is that, okay, if you want to keep this really good knight so far advanced in the position, that's fine. I'll just exchange for it, and you'll have these kind of awkward doubled pawns on the b-file. Magnus didn't want to do this, and he retreated the knight, but I feel that if you're, if I was black in this position, uh, I might I might go for this and really try and key in on this weak c2 square. The c2 square would be hard to, if these pawns were doubled on the b-file for black, this c2, square, this c2 pawn would be difficult to push because it'd be pushing right through doubled pawns. But Magnus obviously didn't want to do that, and he knows better than I do, so he played knight c6. And after bishop e3, knight e7 white plays bishop f4 a better move here would have been uh knight g3 this bishop f4 is a bit of an inaccuracy and the reason why is because it allows for exchanges to occur and exchanges that result in doubled pawns for white so after bishop takes f3 g takes f3 bishop takes f4 knight takes f4 we've reached an end game position where even though white's up a pawn they have two sets of doubled pawns and it's just really awkward position for them uh, even even with this though, the position does look very drawish for both sides. Rook c6 defending this weak a6 pawn. White centralizes their their rooks, and now here comes black knights to come to a square here to kind of put some pressure on this weak f3 pawn. That's exactly what black's going to go for. White has to defend this f3 pawn. And here, uh, Magnus made a move that um, probably probably not his best move. Uh, the computer recommends something like g6, and after. Uh, after g6, the rook coming over to f6 to really put pressure on this f3 square. The, the reason why you play g6 is so that the knight has a safe square to come back to if it needs a protected square, and to give the king breathing room to kind of avoid any back rank, back rank mating. But uh, that's not what Carlson played. He played king f8. After knight g2, uh, going for the exchange of knights here, obviously Carlson wants to avoid that. The knight comes back to e5 rook e5 and g6 gets played anyway so in this position right here obviously this pawn needs to be defended because this this rook's attacking this pawn so white has to figure out how to do that a better move would have been king e2 and we'll see why in a second king e2 would have been a better move but in the palm she plays knight e1 carlson kind of remaneuvers the knight in preparation for pushing this pawn the rook comes back carlson plays f5 with an attack on the rook and after rook e3, knight e6, the knight comes back to g2. So old, what Nepomniachtchi has done is basically move the knight back and forth when it would have just been better to move the king. 
would have saved would have saved him a move. Here, Carlson realized that he could win a pawn on White's queen side. So with uh, b4, Napoleonacci is put in a little bit of a bind. Obviously, if uh, if black if White ex takes Black's pawn, Black will take back. They'll have nice connected pawns here, and White will have this. Very weak, very awkward pawn right here, this kind of pawn island with uh, doubled pawns here, which is not very good for white. So white doesn't want to exchange here, but white also knows that if they let black take here, then this B pawn becomes very, very weak, and this rook's just going to come over and pick this B pawn off. So Napomniachi makes a great decision, and uh, in my opinion, kind of a tough concept to find, and that is he needs to march his king over to the queen side to support the pawns. So after king e2, rook b8, king d2, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, Black picks off the pawn. So now uh, material is even. White has double pawns on the king side. And the kind of the gamble that Magnus played in the beginning where he gave up his e pawn for the bishop pair, he has ended up getting that e pawn back. King c2 pushing the rook off the square. Rook b7, h4. White's going to try and break through on the king side now. King f7, rook e e1, king f6, knight e3. Rook d7, putting some pressure on this d3 square. And after knight c4, rook e7. The threat here is that if the knight comes to e5, it'll be forking the, the two black rooks. So Magnus has to play some move with the rooks, and he plays rook e7, which is basically an admission of a draw here. After knight e4, rook d6, the game was drawn with threefold repetition. So this was the position in move 45 when the game was called a draw uh, due to threefold repetition. So really a great game from both players. I think Magnus really showed that he came with really well prepared with a lot of preparation playing that that knight e5 move and giving up that e pawn. He obviously knew that that was a line he could go into and that the bishop pair would be adequate compensation for the pawn. Nepomniachi uh, did really well, played very solidly uh, in a variation that I, I imagine he didn't, uh, even though it was clear that he had looked at the line, you know, once you once you get deep into those lines, it's, it's really difficult um, to find the right moves of the board. Napomniachi did a, did a great job. A lot of players were thinking that, a lot of people were thinking that Magnus was going to um, fight for this a little bit longer, trying to turn his kind of very slight endgame advantage here into a victory. Um, but I think playing as black, he was really happy to, to, especially to start out with a draw. So both players, I think, feeling good, playing well, and we'll see how they do tomorrow in game two. I hope you liked this video. Please like and subscribe and comment below. Um, you can always hit me up on MTX Chess Official on chess.com. I'm, I'm happy to play. And uh, we will be following all the games for the World Chess Championship. So uh, you can follow it on chess.com or on Light Chess. I'll put links in the description below. I'll see you guys next time.